Welcome out to Vail. It's such a special weekend to be able to worship together. Would you stand and sing with us? In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There is mercy in your eyes To fulfill
feel free to grab a seat. Man, it is so great to see you today. Whether you're in the room with us today, or you're with us online, thanks so much for joining us. And if you're new here, man, I'd like to say thanks so much for coming and checking us out. Maybe you had a family member or friend come and invite you. We are so glad you're here with us. Maybe you just found us on our live stream. But if you're new with us, we would love to be able to connect with you. So would you do me a favor, if you're new with us at Vail, simply do this. If you take out your phones, text the keyword NEXT to the number on the screen, which is 309-777-0677. And if you're in the room with us today, like, hey, I don't have my phone with me, don't worry, we've got you covered. If you look in the seat back pocket in front of you, there is a red My Next Step card. Would you do me a favor, would you grab that card, fill that out, check the I'm New Here box, and as you leave today, drop it off at the info center. And here's the great thing. We do two things for every card and text that we get in. The first thing we do, we make a donation on your behalf to one of our local ministry partners. So simply by being here today or texting in or filling out a card, you made a difference in our local community. Second thing we do, we give you a free gift. Just to say thanks so much for checking us out. We hope you had a great experience and we'd love to see you back again soon. But as we continue our worship experience through giving here at Vail, we believe, man, that God has hardwired us for generosity. We believe it's something he, he truly wants for you and not something He wants from you. So if you want to continue in that spirit of generosity here at Vail, there are four safe and secure ways to do that. If you brought a physical gift or an offering, we actually have a drop box located at each one of our exits in the two in the lobby. You can take out your phones and text Vail to 77977. You can go online at our website at Vail.church or go to our Vail Church app to set up a one-time or recurring gift. All of these ways are simple so we can stay faithful to the generosity that God has wired us up to live by. As we get ready for today's message, you can do a few things. You can get your Bibles out, get something to take notes with. You can open the Vail Church app, hit the message notes tab, and as you're doing that, let's see what's happening at Life of Vail through Vail News. Hey Vail Church, my name is Zach and I serve with the photography team here at Vail. We're so glad that you decided to make church a part of your weekend. Baptism is an important step of obedience that shows others we have personally accepted Jesus as our Lord and forgiver of our lives. We would love to celebrate that public profession of faith with you at our baptism celebration on August 19th and the 20th. If you are ready to take this next step of faith, you could sign up by texting the word NEXT to 309-777-0677. Everyone has a next step, and if this is yours, let's celebrate that together. If you have any questions about baptism, you can stop by the Information Center after the service, and they can connect you with one of our pastors to answer those questions. Our team is here to help. Are you looking to deepen your relationship with God and grow in your growth community? If so, we invite you to join Rooted. Whether you've been a follower of Christ for a long time or you're new to the faith, Rooted is an experience that is designed to help activate your spiritual growth and surround you with people who are ready to grow, support, and do life with you. If you aren't experiencing daily what you are made for, then, well, Rooted is the next step in your journey. And if it's been a few years since you went through Rooted, maybe it's time for a tune-up. Classes begin in September on Mondays from 6 to 8 p.m. You can register at our website at veil.church. Now, let's get ready for today's message. Well, good morning, Vail Church. How are you doing? Oh, we can do a little better. Good morning, Vail Church. How you doing? There we go. Well, my name is Matt. I get to be the executive pastor here on our team. And last week, I know some of you were mad at me. Some of you expressed that you were mad at me. Some of you offered me money. But you were kind of hanging out on the edge. We had a cliffhanger this last week about who was going to be our next lead pastor. And so today, you get to find out that information. But I actually wanted to take a minute and just let uh, someone who's been a friend of Ale for a long time, been highly invested here, uh, recently has become the lead pastor of Parkview Christian Church. Go ahead and give a round of applause for Ted Max. Well, good morning, Vail Church. You guys look great. Good to see you. Um, for those of you that don't know me, if you're new maybe in the last couple months, uh, my name is Ted Max, and I got the privilege and pleasure of serving on staff here as the lead pastor for the last 10 years at Vail, and then on staff for a total of 17 years. And over the last six months, um, I kind of went through this process of feeling like God was leading me to a new season and a new chapter in ministry, and um, we've kind of settled in that space. In fact, in two weeks, I'll beginning, uh, begin as the lead pastor of Parkview Christian Church up in the south side 
suburbs of Chicago. And uh, I wanted to share with you real quick just a little bit of that journey real fast because we're coming to a, a change at Vail today that I get to announce, and I'm excited that I get to be the one to do that uh, with you and for you. But I wanted to give you some context. Um, it was about eight, nine months ago that I began feeling like God was releasing me from this place, which is really difficult because this is a place that I have loved, um, that I have enjoyed being uh, the pastor at. I have um, just grown so much here and experienced so much of God's provision and power and watching him move in this place uh, that when that came, um, I, I was kind of like, God, you're going to really have to show me this is what you want. And it was crazy because at every turn, God opened every single door like at the right time in the right way. In fact, my wife, who is very stable, she's one of those people like stability is her like key, like love language, like make me feel stable and I will be happy. And um, I always talked to her about, hey, the day might come that we move on. And she was always like, please don't do that. I like it where I am. I love my friends, my family, my church. Um, I love where I'm at. And when I shared with her that I felt like God was leading me to this next step, she actually for the first time was like, hey, I think I'm ready. And I feel like God is leading us in that same way. And so it was kind of this confirmation moment. And we saw each of these moments as God opened the door, opened the door, opened the door, and we felt at peace about the decision. But there was one thing, if I can be really honest, that I didn't share with you guys because you never get up in front of your church and say, this is the one thing I'm terrified of. Um, but the one thing I was scared of is honestly this place. This was the place that I was most nervous about because I knew that there was going to have to be a new leader that was going to have to step in and lead this place. And I wanted the absolute best person for that role. And so I told uh, the team that I'd be available to help them look, to search. Uh, well, as they began the search, we had tons of candidates come in, lots of great candidates, great resumes, great experience, and we started going through those candidates, but there was one candidate uh, whose name got tossed in, and it was someone that I knew, uh, someone who I had a relationship with and spent time with, and uh, so they said, hey, because that person is someone you know, it's kind of a conflict of interest, we're going we're gonna to interview this person, because really, we need to make this decision for Vail outside of you. It can't be Ted's decision. It needs to be the leadership's decision. And I was like, I, I agree with that. And so he went through the process. And as they began to go through and kind of whittle down candidate after candidate, they got down to three. Then they got down to two. And then they got down to one. And when they got down to the one, they, they reached out and said, hey, we, we've kind of whittled down to one candidate. It happens to be the one that you know. Would you come in and share your thoughts about potentially this person being the next lead pastor at Vail Church, and it was fun for me to stand in front of our leadership team that has done a phenomenal job, done a great job during this search, and for me to be able to look them in the eyes and honestly say, out of all the candidates, out of all the resumes, out of all the, all the people that we looked at, this is the person that I could have chosen, this is the person that I would have chosen to lead this church. And it was exciting for them to come to that same conclusion and see that this is what God was leading. And so today, I get the privilege to introduce you to your new lead pastor, Pastor Sean Jensen. If you could help me welcome him to the stage. Appreciate you. Wow, guys, thanks so much. Man. Woo, all right. Hey, I still got to preach, all right? So, hey, if you could stay standing for a second, though, because I really appreciate that applause. It's been such a warm welcome, and we thank Vail for all of that. Um, but I just want to make sure that before you sit down that we give the person who's doing all of this the biggest praise, and his name is Jesus. And so can we thank God for all that he's doing? There we go. Very good. Awesome. Uh, well, before, I have a lot to say, but I'm going to say it a little bit in this, but it's just an honor to be here, and I know you have a few more things to share, and then we'll get in, so, yeah. yeah. Well, if you guys want to go to grab a seat, um, we're going to do the most important thing here in a minute. Um, at the end of the service, we're going to get a chance to pray for Sean, pray over Sean, so I want to encourage you. Um, I know that sometimes for some of you, it's like as soon as the preaching ends, you're like, it's time to go. Today, I want to ask you to stick around. Um, we're just going to spend a moment at the end, just pray a prayer of blessing over Sean his wife, um, their family as they step into this role, as they take on this mantle. Um, and so we're going to get to that in just a few moments. But um, real quick, I just want to take a moment just to tell you how excited I am for this season. I'm excited for the word that you're going to hear today as Sean is going to preach. Um, and it's the most important thing we're going to get to do today is we're going to get to learn from God's word. And so real quick, if you guys give me a good solid amen for Sean as he gets ready to bring the word of the Lord for us today. Let's go. Thanks, I appreciate you. Love you too. Awesome. Well, hey, before I get jumping in, though, I made, a, I made a mistake last night, and I forgot to put the picture up of my family, because I was just in the moment. So just give me grace. This is completely new, but I'm super excited. But I brought a picture of my family. This is my family. If you guys don't know, that's me. So that's me right there. I'm kidding. I know you're saying all about that. We'll get to it in a second. Uh, that's my wife, Liz, and these are my three daughters. That's Avery. She's nine. Charlie, she's eight. And this one, I know she is so cute. Uh, she's back in Pontiac right now, but if she was with your kids and the kids here, she would be stealing all their snacks right now. That is Millie, 
Carolina, and we are so glad to be a part here um, at Vail. So thank you for opening your arms up for the prayer. Church, you are an amazing church. And in this moment, I just wanna take a moment just to pray and ask God just to bless this moment because I really believe I have a word for you and I think it's gonna encourage us together uh, and we're just gonna celebrate all God's gonna do. So Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for what you're doing. I just pray that our heart to be open to receive this word from you, Lord. This isn't just a word coming from empty pages. This is the book that when we read it, it reads us. And so I just pray, Lord, that we would lean in and that your presence is here to encourage us and equip us for everything you have. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, uh, as I was praying, I really sensed God lead me to a section of scripture that I thought would be perfect uh, for this weekend. It's this crazy tag team moment, this handoff, this baton pass, this transition in scripture that if you're new to scripture, you may not know about it. That's okay. We're glad that you're here. If you're not new to scripture, you may understand where I'm going in this moment, but we're going to talk about this guy named Moses. And if you don't know Moses, Moses actually led the people of uh, Israel, God's chosen people out of slavery after they've been there for 400 years. God uses him to pull them out of Egypt, right? And as he's pulling them out of Egypt, they look at the Red Sea. God splits the Red Sea before Moses and the people of Israel, and then he drowns the enemy behind them. It's Moses that leads them in the wilderness for 40 years as their fearless leader, and they had no food. And in that moment, under his leadership, God literally brings Uber Eats from the sky, which is pretty awesome. DoorDash, if you're one of those, like I'm more of a DoorDash person. Okay. Okay, well, whatever you prefer. And then they're traveling through the wilderness in that moment. This is the same Moses that God actually gives the 10 commandments that we just spent two months unpacking as a church. This is Moses, a notorious leader. People look up to him. And in this moment, before they get to the land that was promised to Israel, that was promised to Moses, he dies looking at it on the other side of it. And so he sees the promised land and he dies and the people of Israel mourn him for 30 days. And after 30 days, God has a plan. There's a transition. There's a handoff. And it's to this guy named Joshua. And now Joshua is where we're going to look today. It's in Joshua 1. If you have your Bible, we have it for the screens. You can read it this week. But Joshua 1, 2 says this, Moses, my servant is dead. I love how God just gets right to the point. It's like, we know he's dead, right? He's like, Moses, my servant is dead. And just, just in case you forgot, now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. So here's the moment where God says, okay, Moses is done, and now it is Joshua's turn. Now, I want to be very clear about some things. I want to set the foundation here. First off, we just want to note, Pastor Ted is not dead. He is alive. That was him in the flesh. So that's not what I'm saying. And I am not actually Joshua, okay? So I'm not trying to say I'm Joshua in this moment. That, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am trying to get at is when it comes to the situation we are in and what we see in Scripture, it's very, very similar. We see an outstanding leader hand a baton to a younger, more handsome, <laughs> but also shorter person. <laughs> Got to razz myself a little bit too. I don't want you to hate me right away, all right? So... Uh, he hands off the baton in that moment to Joshua. And so it's very similar to see what's going on. And as I used to read the scripture, I always looked because I'm a pastor and a leader. I always saw it from the leader perspective and the pastor perspective. But man, this week when I was praying on it, I realized, I wonder what the people of Israel felt like. Probably a lot like how some of you feel in the seats right now, that you have to watch someone who was great and faithful in leadership, and now you're getting a brand new person wondering what God is going to do. And so I'm just going to encourage you today. We're going to look at a few things that God tells Joshua that I think is going to listen, not just encourage you, but encourage me in this season too as we step into this together. But before we move forward, because we are going to move forward, right? God did not bring us this far to go backwards. He brought us this far to move forward. But we need to first honor the past, because sometimes in order to move forward, you have to honor the past. And I thought, what a best way to do this by this quote by J. Oswald Sanders. He says, a work originated by God and conducted on spiritual principles will surmount the shock of a change of leadership and indeed will probably thrive better as a result. I love this. A work originated by God, not man, conducted on spiritual principles, biblical principles, when leadership changes, it will not be shocked by it, but they'll continue to thrive. And I just want to take a moment to realize, man, that's exactly the type of church Vail is. Vail is a church, I believe, that was originated by God. We are seeing God move week in and week out. It is thriving. It has been built on the principles and the foundation of Christ because of faithful leadership. And I just want to let you know, I'm excited as the newly pastor just to jump on this speeding train and say, we're going to continue to thrive for the kingdom of God. Because 
because it's been an amazing thing that God is doing through you. So I just wanna take a moment to honor the past by celebrating Pastor Ted and Amy and all the leadership, the VLT. Let's just thank God for people who prayed, you, everyone involved in this moment. You are an absolutely incredible church, and I'm excited to see how God continues to allow us not just to survive, but thrive in this season. But now, we're looking forward. Now, it's time to move forward. So a few things in this new season as we're trying to figure this thing out um, that we can hold dear to, that God promised Joshua that I think he's giving us as well. And the first thing he tells Joshua is, you have a promise. And Phil, I just wanna let you know, we have a promise. If you're writing notes down, that's the first thing we see in this moment when the handoff happens, God reminds Joshua right away about the promise he has been given. And it's amazing to see this promise. He says this in Joshua 1, 3 through 5. It says, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. I'm gonna write that. This is super important. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river to Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. And I tell you, is what it says here, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, as I promised Moses, I am now promising you. I love this moment because it didn't take long for God to share the promise again. You know what I love about God? God does not make promises he doesn't intending to keep. I mean, I know that we're in 2023 and we have a lot of people in leadership who I'm not gonna mention who can make big promises. And sometimes we're excited about those promises and then we never see them come to pass. Our God is not like that. He doesn't just make promises, he keeps promises. I was raised in the church and my grandfather was a church planner and I remember the church get wild up when he would say that. He'd be like, our God is not just a promise maker. And everyone's like, yeah, and they lean in. He goes, he's a promise keeper. I just remember people jumping up and go, woo! And I was like, I'm a little scared, but this is awesome. I don't know what's going on. Because he keeps his promises. If he makes a promise, he keeps his promise because God is faithful. I don't know what has been broken in your life, but you can trust God with your life. He will make promises and he will keep promises. And what I love about this is it's a really good time to remind Joshua that he is still holding to that promise. Why? Because he wants Joshua to know the death of a good leader, the death of Moses does not mean the death of my promise. The wilderness season does not mean my promises stop. I know you've been wandering for 40 years, but the time span from the promise that has started will not stop my promises. Listen, Israel, I know you've been rebellious. I've been rebellious, but can I remind you, even your rebellion will not stop the promises of God. He goes on to tell him, the slavery in Egypt did not stop my promise because before I gave it to Moses, 400 years before in Genesis, I told Abraham, if you step out, I'll bless you and I'll make you a nation. So even the time span and the people change will not stop the promises of God. He told Abraham first, which means people may change, but God's promise always remains. And that's something we gotta remember. If God gave Baal a promise, it doesn't matter what changes, he remains the same. And we see that, but here's, here's a little caveat with that because we get excited about that. Yeah, nothing I can do can get in the promise of God. Let's go. I'm gonna do nothing. I'm gonna make poor choices. I know we all make them, but hear me out what I'm saying. God does have promises for us. Our question is, do we wanna be a part of them? See, what I know about Israel, if you don't know about Moses, here's something that crazy that happened. When they split, when God split the Red Sea and they stepped into the wilderness, did you know they could have stepped into the promises of God just 11 days after that? 11 days. Like, that's not very long, that's two, that's two weeks. But instead, because of their unbelief, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Could you imagine going on a road trip, right? Like, hey, we're gonna go somewhere that's gonna take two hours and it ends up taking like two weeks. Like, that'd be awful. They are in this road trip for 40 years, and why? Well, Joshua and Caleb at this moment, 11 days in, Moses asked them to go scout out the promised land, and so they go with 10 other spies. And what they do is they see giant grapes, they see amazing fruit, they see this land that was flowing with milk and honey, is what they call it, there's provision there, it's a great land. But they saw that, but the other spies saw the giants and the obstacles and the fight, because how many people know that God's greatest blessings are sometimes wrapped in burdens? 
And so they see this and they come back and Moses says, should we go? And Joshua and Caleb like, let's do this. We're going, we can do this. We have a big God, it doesn't matter. The other 10 said, no, we can't do this. They have big giants in that land and big walls. There's no way. And we find out just 11 days in that they end up not going into the promise of God because the other 10 shared a bad report. And what they should have stepped into 11 days took 40 years for them to step into. Actually, the whole generation of that time died off. And now Joshua was about ready to lead into a new generation. Why do I share this with the promises of God? Because here's my question for us, Vale. Are we going to wander around the promises of God? Or are you ready to walk into the promises of God? Because if God has promises for us, we need to learn how we can say, you know what? It's time to walk into what God has provided for us. We're not gonna wander. We're not gonna bicker. We're not gonna complain. We're gonna come together and we're gonna walk into what God has for us. And so he has a promise for us but now we gotta walk into it. And my question for you is, the promise is different from the Old Testament. We're not going to Israel and getting all this land, but Jesus did promise something for his church. Actually, when Jesus was on earth, one of his disciples named Peter was hanging out with him. And there was a moment that happened and God, Jesus asked him, Peter, who do you think I am? Who do people say I am? And he said all these different things and he looks right at Peter and says, Peter, but who do you say I am? And Peter mentions to him, he goes, you're the Messiah. You're the living God. You're the son of God. And in that moment, Jesus responds with this and it's recorded in Matthew. And he goes, and I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now this is super important because a lot of times, every time I read this, when I looked at this word rock, it actually means Peter. Peter's name means rock. And so we find out that when the Holy Spirit falls after Jesus dies and rises again, Jesus uses Peter to preach the gospel and 3,000 people get saved and the church is birthed in this moment, right? And so he's preparing him for that moment. And so a lot of people think that Peter is this rock, but Peter is not the rock. He's a flawed person like you and I, and anything built on flawed people is gonna crumble. What Jesus is saying about the rock is what Peter said before this. He goes, you are the Messiah. You are the son of God. And Jesus says, and upon this rock, upon your statement, on the statement that you think I'm the foundation, he goes, if I'm the foundation on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Darkness will not overcome it. Uh, uh, pain will not overcome it. I will keep moving forward. Now, I don't have time to unpack this whole scripture. We're gonna do it in a couple months together as a church, but there's one principle I wanna pull from this, that if Jesus is the foundation and if Jesus is building his church, nothing can stop his church. Nothing can stop it. And that's why it's so important that we remind ourselves the promise that he gave to the church, that if Jesus is the foundation, if Jesus is at the bottom. And so it's very important this moment that I may be the new pastor, but I am not Jesus. And my goal is to make sure we remind ourselves what this church was built on, and his name is Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. And upon this rock, he will build his church, and the gates of Hades cannot stand against it. We have a promise to build his church. We have a promise to build his church. But how many people know if we have a promise, we're gonna need some strength to do it. That's why he tells Joshua the second promise. We have your presence. We have God's presence. Super good. Because he doesn't just tell Joshua, here's your promise. He tells Joshua, I'm gonna equip you to fulfill that promise. Because anytime God gives you a promise, I'm gonna tell you something, it is daunting. It is scary. Usually God's dreams can discourage us because they're so big, they can only be obtained with his help. And Joshua realizes this in this moment. I can't imagine what he's going through and what he's facing. And he has this promise, but in order to fulfill that promise, he needs something close to him. And that's God's presence. And we see actually in Joshua 9 that God actually affirms this in Joshua. He says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Can we just point out the fact that God does not just encourage Joshua. He doesn't say, hey, it would be a good idea. He actually commands Joshua. Hey, I command you, be strong and courageous. Try that with your wife when she's upset. I command you to chill. <laughs> yeah, all like, you better not. This looked at their husband and go, I dare you. Like, I, you try it. He's like, I'll go from laying hands to throwing hands, right? That's what, but don't do that to your husband. Anyway, so. I have commanded, so he's commanding Joshua. He's not just encouraging him. He's telling him, like, I'm telling you, be strong and courageous. And how many people know 
that this is an important saying. Actually, this phrase, be strong and courageous, is found four times in just Joshua 1. In just the first chapter, in the, the handoff to Joshua, we see that commandment four times. You know why it's in there four times? Because Joshua's human, just like us. I'm so glad he puts it in there four times. You know why? Because I need to be reminded more than four times to be strong and courageous when I try stepping into the promises of God. Can I tell you how many times I needed to be reminded before I even got on, this, on the stage to be like, Sean, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Like right now, I feel like puking and running away, right? Like, I don't know about you, but sometimes there's moments in our life that God's calling us into that he says, hey, I wanna remind you that you're gonna have to be strong and courageous. Why? Because there's gonna be moments you feel weak and discouraged. And maybe you're in that place right now. Maybe you're weak and discouraged. And you're like, Sean, I hear what you're saying, but I don't feel that way. And why did God command it? And the reason he commanded it, listen, is because he won't command something from our life unless he gives us the power to fulfill that command in our life. So what was it? It's right here. I've commanded you to be strong and courageous. What do you do? For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now we saw this in the first scripture I read when he said, and I will be with you just as I was with Moses. See, the same promise I gave Moses is yours but the same presence I gave Moses is yours. This is super important, church, to remember that God doesn't just call us to hard things. He equips us to do hard things. But what is it? The most important thing, the presence of God. If we do not make the presence a priority, we will suffer. But if we make the presence of God a priority, nothing can stand in the way. Israel may have had a different leader, but they had the same God. They had the same God. And I think there's no better reminder for me and you today, because I gotta remind myself, I may be a new pastor, but Vail, you still have the same God. I may be a new leader, but you still have the same Lord. And listen, there's one more for you in case it doesn't seek in yet. I may be a different guy, but you still have the same God who is grateful that it's not about a man, it's about God who's holding this thing up. That God started and he will complete it. It helps me breathe a whole lot more. So I can't be Jesus for you. I can be a pastor, but I'm not the same God. And listen, it wasn't just the same God who was leading Ted. It was the same God leading Joshua, the same God leading Moses, the same God who led his son Jesus to the cross to die for us and got him up out of that grave so that we could experience new life in Christ. The same God leading that 2,000 years ago is the same God leading Baal today. We have his presence. And because we have his presence, listen, church, this isn't just for me, this is for all of us. We can be bold we can be strong and we can be courageous because there might be some moments in Vail's new future that you might have to get uncomfortable. And God says, be strong and courageous. Here's, here's what I know about the presence of God and how we can be strong and courageous. I, I showed you a picture of my girls. Before we had our third kid, uh, Millie Carolina, our oldest, Avery and Charlie, we took them to the park. They were probably like three and four. I can't remember the age. I don't remember which daughter it was, but I remember we, we took them to a new park because when you're, when you're a parent, you gotta change it up a little bit uh, and nothing makes you like a superhero parent than taking them to a new park. They're like, wow, a new park. You're the best dad ever, best day ever, right? Like kids make you feel so awesome. Like we just went to a different place in the neighborhood. It was great. And uh, we get there and the first thing they see is the slide. And they look at the slide like, this is incredible. Look at that slide, because I don't know about you, but anytime I go to the park, the first thing I notice is, how big is that slide? Now, the cool thing is, is I'm barely 5'7", if I even am 5'7". So I can still enjoy the slides to this day. <laughs> like, some of you have no idea what it's like to slide down the slide at Chick-fil-A, but your boy does. <laughs> and some of you are missing out, because you will never get to experience that. And so before you make fun of me, just realize, when's the last time you slid down the slide at Chick-fil-A? Never. So anyways... <laughs> Weird flex, but all right. So, uh, so they're wanting to slide. They're like, Daddy, I want to slide. But in order for them to slide, they've realized this playground doesn't have the same steps. It actually has kind of like a jungle gym step. So there's actually a little bit of an obstacle to get up to the playground. There's a big gap where they could fall through to get up to the top. I remember I was watching from 30 or 40 feet away, and they didn't know I was watching. And I was just kind of watching the kids. And I noticed one of my daughters walks up to that thing, and she walks up and puts one foot on the first bar. And you could tell in that moment that she kind of started shaking. And as she was shaking, she put another foot up on the bar and she stood there on that first one. And as she looked up, she was like, nope. And she got right back down <laughs> and she just kind of went away and she felt defeated because she wanted to go down the slide. Now you'll hear more about my background and what God has delivered me from, but I used to deal with 
really bad anxiety, like paralyzing anxiety, uh, depression and suicidal thoughts. And you'll hear more about that story in the future, but I've overcome a lot with God's help in my life. And so in that moment, I'm kind of a direct, intense person. Uh, and so when I saw my daughter look defeated, I was like, oh, not on my watch. There's absolutely no way this is gonna happen. I don't know where my dad's are. We're like, no, we're going back to that thing. I where my mom's are. And so I picked up my daughter and I put her right back where that apparatus was, this jungle gym thing, and I got down on one knee. I didn't have to get real low because we're at the same height. And so when I got down on one knee, I was like, listen, and she looked at me in the eyes. I was like, guess what? She goes, what? I'm like, you're gonna climb this thing. You know why? She goes, why? I'm like, because you're a Jensen. And I was like, I don't even know what that means, but it felt good in the moment, and so I'm just gonna keep, I'm just going along with this. And I said, you're brave. I said, you're courageous, and guess what? She goes, what? I was like, I'm gonna be here the whole time. I'm not gonna help, but I'm gonna be right next to you. It was in that moment she looked at me with a different look, and I kid you not, honestly, there was no tremors, there was no shaking. She goes, okay, and she just went, boop, 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 jumped up, and she was like, woo! (laughs) And I looked at my wife, she goes, what did you say? I'm like, I'm telling you, you married a king, that's all I gotta tell you. I I didn't know what I said, but she went up and she slid down, how many people know? She just went up, back down, up, back, the whole day now, because she conquered that obstacle, she was able to go down the slide. And I think there's a lot of slides in our life that we're wanting to get to, but we're scared to go over the obstacles. Or maybe the slide is a marriage, and because the first one broke apart, you're scared to go over the obstacle again. Or maybe there's something, maybe you've been in a church where there was a transition before and it didn't end up good, and so this feels like an obstacle, and so you're feeling a little scared. Can I remind you the difference between my daughter's first attempt and her second attempt? My presence. When I was 40 feet away, she didn't know I was watching, she was terrified. But when she knew her father was right next to her, she was not fearful. Why? Because she realized a few things. My daddy will not let me fall. My daddy will protect me. My daddy's presence means his provision, his protection, and his power. I got this thing. What if I convince you today, the next time you're feeling discouraged, the next time we're feeling weak, we can remind ourselves that we have the presence of God, which means we have his provision, we have his protection, and we have his power. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world that stands against us. If we would remind ourselves today that no matter what the obstacle looks like moving forward, Vail, that we have God's presence, that's what matters. We have the presence of God and the promise of God. He will help us fulfill everything he asks us to fulfill. It's good news. It's good news. Now, I know that's encouraging. Yeah, I got my father's presence. Yeah, we got his promise. They never never end. This is so good. This third one might ruffle little feathers a little bit because this is kind of when we gotta get involved because we may have a promise and we may have the presence to fulfill that promise, but the third thing is we have God's people. We have God's people. Joshua needed the people of God to step into the promises of God. Uh, This is very difficult to understand because yes, God's presence means we have access to his abilities. But listen, God's abilities is not a substitute for human responsibilities. And that's tough because I've realized in my life that we gotta partner with God with some things. A lot of us are praying for miracles, but he's asking us to now be partnering with him to step into those miracles. And what I love about God is he will design a promise for one person, but it can only be reached with other people. It's just like God to say, hey, you can't do this by yourself. Hey, Sean, you can't do this by yourself. Hey, Joshua, I know you're the next leader, but guess what? You're not gonna be able to do this by yourself. He brings the people of God, us in this room to fulfill his promises. Yes, we have his abilities, but that doesn't mean that we don't have responsibilities. You know that word responsibilities means to respond? That's what it means. It means we are responding to God. That's what our faith is. Jesus dies and rises again. If you don't know who Christ is, what can you do? We can respond in faith and receive new life. When we come in, we worship. If we had a good week or we had a bad week, it doesn't matter on earth because our God never changes. And in the bad and the good, guess what? We respond in worship. When we serve, we, we, we respond because of Jesus first loved us. He first served us. We respond. Our faith is just response. And so it's hard to come here on Sunday and be like, cool, we have a promise. Cool, we have his presence. But now he's saying, church, are you willing to respond? See, in this moment, Joshua has to respond. And so Joshua builds up the courage to now share to the people that God has with him. And there's two and a half tribes that have actually settled on on the wrong side of the promised land. That's the place that they wanted to settle because their livestock stayed there. And so he reminded himself that he needed people. And so Joshua's response to the people that we're gonna read in a second reveals that he needs people to fulfill the promises of God. 
Check what he, what he says to these tribes in Joshua 1, 13 through 15. He goes, remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, the Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Now, he's got to, I love this because this is like leadership 101. You see what he did here? He totally name dropped Moses. He goes, you guys remember him? <laughs> like, I know him. Like, it's okay. We're cool. Uh, I just want to remind you uh, that Moses, the same promise in the same presence. He goes, remember what he promised Moses. He goes on to say, your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan, but all your fighting men, this is important, all your fighting men ready for battle must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to actually help them until the Lord gives them rest. You have rest, but now I need you to fight until everyone gets rest, as he has done for you. And until they too have taken possession of the land, the Lord your God is giving them. So he's commissioning people saying, hey, we're not in the promised land yet. And when we get to the promised land, there's going to be battles. Yes, it's a great place, but God's already delivered us from these things, but we're going to have to fight, which means it's going to take work to build God's church. It, it takes work to build a godly marriage. It, it takes work to take God's scripture and put it into practice. It, it takes work. It takes responsibility. And Joshua says, I know that you already have rest, but I want to tell you that I need your help to go over and fight for these people until they find rest. So I have bad news for any people in here who are like myself, who like to do things by themselves. Like this is where me and my wife get in the most arguments. I said, babe, you can do it your way or we can do it the right way. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't advise that. I'm not saying it's a good, this is not a marriage lesson, all right? I'm not saying do that because uh, I got in the doghouse real quick, okay? So, but I'm saying is I'm that person that's like, I'll just do it because if I do it, I'll do it the right way. I don't need anybody and I do this. And we can convince ourselves that we don't need anybody and we forget that every destination and purpose that God has planned for our life can only be accomplished with other people. And he designed it that way on purpose, and so if your like motto key song is riding solo, listen, you might go quick and you might go somewhere fast, but you will not be in it for the long game. I've heard someone say, if you wanna go fast, go by yourself. If you wanna stay long, go with some friends. And so church, Joshua says, listen, God does not need Joshua, but Joshua needs godly people. And Joshua realized this. He couldn't do this by himself. Can I just remind you today? As I pastor this church, I just want to remind you that I can't do this by myself. It was never supposed to be like that. It was never supposed, actually my job as a pastor is to equip the saints for their works of ministry. My job is to make sure you feel equipped to step into every promise that God has for you and for those around you. And I believe, honestly, hear my heart, I believe that God is not done with Vail Church. I believe there are some promised lands in some of your marriages and some of your lives, but beyond that, I believe there's some promised lands in Bloomington Normal, in McLean County, and even beyond that God's gonna use Vail to do, and it's gonna be an amazing thing to see. I truly believe that. We have some promised lands that we need to step into, but guess what? It's gonna take God's people. It's gonna take people saying we are on board. We're gonna continue to do what we've been doing this entire time. Y'all, it's, so, it's such a blessing. I've been telling people all weekend to step into a church who gets it who's been faithful in serving, who's been faithful in giving, who's been faithful in inviting, because it won't shock a change of leadership because it was built on the right things. But here's my question for us today. We have God's promise. We have his presence. I believe God's asking this question for Vail today. Does he have his people? Does he have his people? Because it's gonna take the people of God to fulfill the promises of God. Write that down. The promises of God can only be fulfilled through the people of God. That's just super important to understand because yeah, God can do it, but he wants us along with the journey. You see, what I love about scripture as we're wrapping up is we look at scripture and we forget that Jesus does not just show up in the second part of this book. See, a lot of times I hear people when I'm talking about church or people that don't go to church, they say, listen, like, I love Jesus. I love the parts about Jesus, the gospels, but I'm not a big fan of the whole Bible. I'm like, well, you can't do that. Because actually the Bible is all about Jesus. He doesn't just show up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He actually shows up in Genesis and Revelation. He shows up in Deuteronomy and Ezekiel. He, he shows up in Daniel and all of these books. He doesn't just show up on the scene in the New Testament. He's actually right here in Joshua. 
And I don't know if you noticed it, but we actually see a picture of Jesus and Joshua that's preparing the nation of Israel of what's to come. And in this moment, Moses has died, but, but Joshua is now the leader. And, and, and right here in this moment, Joshua has leading people out of the wilderness. They've been in slavery. They've been in the wilderness. They've been relying on God and they have yet to step into everything God has for them, but they're still on the other side of it. And the only way to get into that place is see a miracle hand of God to split the Jordan River. Only what God can do as they take a step of faith. And it says that when they take a step of faith, they can step into the promises of God. So when we look at Joshua, what we're seeing is actually a picture of Jesus. Jesus is a greater Joshua. Why? Because all of us were in the wilderness. All of us were in slavery to sin. All of us needed a leader to save us from death and sin. All of us needed someone to go ahead of us, to split the sea, and to make a way that only God could make it. Who did it? His name was Jesus. Our sin put us in slavery. Our sin put us in the wilderness. And when Jesus went to the cross, he said, I will take your penalty. I will take Sean's penalty, and I'll put it on that cross. And three days later, I will rise from the grave to show you that I am who I say I am. And if you believe in me, guess what we get to do? We get to walk into the promised land. We get to walk into the blessings of God. So if you are in Christ today, I just want to remind you, you are in the promised land. You have his blessing. You have his presence. You have his inheritance. You have now walked into the place that God's prepared for you. That's exciting news, church. If you are in Christ, you are in the promised land. I know it gets hard on earth. I'm not saying it's easy, but here's why I need you to listen. There are more people outside these walls than maybe in these walls in McLean County and beyond who have yet to step into their promised lands. And Joshua says, hey guys, I, I know that you have found rest for your families, but can I encourage you to go and fight for the rest of other families? Vail, that's my question for you today. If you are in Christ, we've already stepped into the promises of God and we're experiencing his peace and we're experiencing his joy. But Vail Church, can we keep fighting now for those who have not experienced the promised land? Because I tell you, the greatest miracle is not when someone is healed of disease, even though that's important. It's not when a blind eye is open, even though I believe God can still do it. The greatest miracle that we can experience today is when someone puts their trust in Jesus and they go from death to life. When someone says, I choose to follow Jesus. That's their promised land. So if you're here and you've experienced your promised land, can I commission you today? Can we keep fighting for other people to find their promised land? Can we keep serving so people can step in their promised land? Can we keep inviting? Can we continue to be as generous as a church as you've already been? Because I believe where God is leading us, it's going to be a wild ride, but he's looking for people to fight for people who can't fight for themselves. And I believe we can do it. I believe we're the church for it. And I'm, a, I'm excited to be a part of it. So here's the question. We have his promise. He will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. We have his presence. We can be strong and courageous. Does God have his people? That's your response. That's where we respond. Not just today, but moving forward. Let me pray for you. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, I'm gonna say a prayer for you as well. At the end of my prayer, I'm gonna say a prayer that you can pray to step into your promised land. You may be a sinner, but God is a, Jesus is a way better savior. And I'm gonna tell you how you can put your faith in Christ by confessing him as your Lord and savior. So let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for such a honestly holy moment. Lord, I know that we're looking at the scripture of Joshua and the promised land. I just pray, Father God, that we would remind ourselves that even though you fulfilled that, you're the same God today. And there's some places you're taking us to, Father God, that seem too big for us, but Lord, they are perfectly the size for you. And so could you remind us of the promises? Could you remind people who are discouraged right now and weak that your presence is with them? Could you remind us, Father God, that you fight for us and that you are faithful? Could you remind me Father God, that I may be a new pastor, but Lord, we serve the same God. And help us to be strong and courageous, whatever that looks like. Help us to fight for those, Father, who still needs to experience you. We have relatives of people in this room who don't know Jesus. We have coworkers from in this room who don't know Jesus. We have people who are in the wilderness and they're slave to so many things and they're hurting and they're broken and they're looking for the peace that we have. Help us to fight for their rest. And Lord, we just pray as we do that, that you will provide for us, you'll protect us, and that you'll help us. Lord, we thank you so much for this promise. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here and you wanna cross that line of faith by putting your trust in Jesus, here's the prayer you can pray. You just say, God, 
thank you for sending Jesus for me. I know I'm the sinner. I broke the relationship. But you're the savior. You heal the relationship. Heal me today. I put my faith in you. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for rising again. I believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we celebrate God in his word one more time today, church? Come on, he's a good God. Would you stand as we respond together?
stand. Well, you may remain standing for just a moment. I'm gonna invite uh, Pastor Sean and Lizzie up here and our leadership team and some of our staff. And here in just a moment, we're gonna ask you just to extend your hand. Uh, I believe in the power of prayer in a church that prays um, and the strength that's in that uh, is huge. And so in a moment here, we're gonna just pray uh, God's blessing upon Sean and upon Lizzie, upon their family as they step into this season, as they lead boldly here. And, and our prayer, prayer is also gonna be for you guys, um, for this church, for God's people in Bloomington Normal and beyond as you make a difference here, as you change this world uh, through the love of Christ. And so that's gonna be our prayer today. And so I wanna invite Jeff Cowden, um, our chairman of our VLT, to come and pray this prayer for our church today. Thank you, Ted. Vail Church family, if you'd please uh, join me in praying over Pastor Sean and Liz. Lord, we just thank you for your blessings that you've bestowed upon Vail Church. We're so grateful for the pastoral leadership that you've provided us. And I'm thankful for our strong and praying church family, our committed staff, our prepared leadership as we truly trusted you as we've all moved through this process. When we look back at this pastor search, we can really see your hand at work and as you open doors and you closed other doors. When we first learned that Ted was leaving here, there was, there was a time of mourning. But Lord, we realized, God, that you are sovereign and your timing is perfect, even in moments that we might not understand. Lord, you helped us to understand that Ted was called to a new opportunity to help grow your kingdom in a new way, which meant that someone else was being called to lead Vail, to take us to new places. Thank you, Lord, for your promise and your presence and the people, as we carried on and were always confident that you would provide. Thank you for leading Sean to us. We ask you to bless him, Liz, and their family as they transition to Bloomington. We thank you in advance for the impact that they will have here at Vail and in our community. We pray that you will use them in amazing ways to grow your kingdom. And we are so excited for what you will provide as we move forward into this next season at Vail. Lord, at this time, we also lift up Authentic Church as they move through their period of transition. We pray for them as they trust, they trust you to lead them. And we also want to lift up Ted and Parkview Church as they enter to their new season. So that together, Lord, we can all serve you and grow your kingdom in the mightiest of ways. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Well, as we prepare to close this service today, I hope you're as excited as I am about the new pastor that's coming to lead us and just to get to know Sean and his journey a little bit more here. Uh, but as we close today, I want to take just a minute. If you're in the room or you're online and you made the decision to follow Jesus, we want to hear about that because we believe that that's the most important decision that you could ever make. And we want to walk alongside you. You can text the word next to the number on the screen right now, or you can fill out the red next step card in the seat back in front of you. We would love to walk alongside you. As we do close the service today, I want to remind you that there's communion at the front of the stage. There's also a prayer team up here to serve your needs if you are in need of prayer. Thank you so much for being in here, and we will see you next week.